Hey, friends and listeners, this is Amory Zanzel, and you're listening to Coming Out and Beyond LGBTQIA Plus Stories Podcast. Welcome, everyone. I'm Barb Rowlandson. And Emery, we are now deep into season four of the Coming Out and Beyond podcast. And congratulations on what has turned out to be just a fantastic season so far. And no thanks to you, Barb Rollinson, my brand new producer who is kicking ass in this podcast. (laughs) So I want to thank Barb and all of our guests and listeners who make this podcast so special. If you're new to this podcast, let me fill you in a bit on what we do here at Coming Out and Beyond. This is a podcast devoted to sharing stories of real people, primarily women, trans, and non-binary folks who have made the brave step of coming out maybe early in life or maybe later in life. And later in life, it's a subjective term. I mean, we have guests on the podcast that are in their 30s, 40s, 50s, 60s, and beyond. And they're from all walks of life. And they've discovered in their life's journey that they aren't quite as straight as they originally thought they were. And the lovely Anne-Marie here, our podcast founder and host, brings her signature compassion, wisdom, and insight as she interviews guests creating a safe space for them to share their stories. And Barb, our podcast producer and occasional co-host and guest, and maybe in the future, a host, joins us regularly for the first time in season four, adding fun, dimension, and a different perspective to topics surrounding the coming out later in life process. So if you're someone who is later in life and early in the coming out process, here is where you are going to find inspiration and some great advice and a glimpse into the joy of what it means to come into your authentic sexuality. So relax, kick your shoes off, grab a cup of coffee or tea or maybe your favorite libation, put your headphones on and join us for the next half hour or so to listen to another great true story about coming out later in life and what lies beyond. Hi, welcome to Coming Out and Beyond LGBTQIA plus stories. This is Anne Marie, and I'm so excited to welcome my de- guest tonight, Hannah Jones. So Hannah's got a great story, and she is she refers to herself as a 35-year-old gay baby. She found out she was gay in drug rehab about three years ago, and she's been sober ever since. Congratulations, Hannah. She refers to it as a slow awakening to already knowing. She's a licensed professional counselor at a community mental health center where she gets to work with those who typically don't have access to quality mental health care. She has an awesome four-year-old son named Truett and also a dog. She's also a dog mom to two Rhodesian Ridgebacks who think they are lap dogs. She's an INFJ and an Enneagram 4. In her free time, Hannah loves doing anything outdoors, especially camping, nature photography, backpacking, bikepacking, marathon running, and kayaking. Her other hobbies include reading nonfiction, drumming, roller derby, and daydreaming about a girlfriend. (laughs) Welcome, Hannah, to the show. Thank you. It's good to be on here. Yeah, I never thought I would be on here. I never thought I would agree to be on here. But um, yeah, I've I've been listening to your show. Um, I started listening to it like a year ago when I started this journey, and it's been a breath of fresh air. So yeah, it's good to be on. So... I'm going to ask you the usual question, but then Hannah and I are actually going to talk about coming out of conservative religious evangelical traditions, because that's what she's did, and she's pretty amazing. So, but first, Hannah, tell me your story. Oh, that's a lot of questions. I know, it is. Um. Tell me your story, well, your coming out story. Gosh, I need like an elevator pitch or something like I can just tell this. Uh, so let's see, about two years ago, um, I decided to go uh, to check myself into rehab because um, I was an alcoholic. Um, I had, I'm a counselor and I had kind of just slowly um, 
started drinking like more and more every night, just trying to like erase the stories in my mind. And I was drinking for another reason too, little, little, um, wasn't known to me at the time, but, um, yeah, in rehab, uh, I was there for about 45 days. Um, and you don't really hear people describe rehab like this, but it was amazing. Uh, it was like, it was the first time, um, that I'd really like learn meditation, learn yoga. It was the first time when like people actually asked me what I wanted, um, which was, I know that sounds weird, but I mean, yeah, like it, it's, um, I grew up in a very like conservative kind of religious culture and being asked what you want, is not really relevant or important. It's, it's all like, you know, what does God want? What does, you know, um, which anyway, I can get to that later, but, um, yeah, so before rehab, I was kind of like, oh, I need to, I need to get there to rehab because this drinking is kind of make me think I might be gay and I just need to sober up because <laughs> like, I'm like, you know, I'm not gay, I'm not gay. And so, um, yeah, so I sobered up <laughs> and, uh, yeah, that, that became very clear, uh, pretty early on, like, uh, that I'm gay or that I would, pretty strong suspicion. Um, and it's weird the way it kind of happened. Uh, I describe it like a slow awakening to always knowing. Um, so it wasn't like there was an epiphany. I'm like, I'm gay, but it was kind of like, I, like I slowly admitted it to myself. Um, I found like somebody I was kind of attracted to, um, there. Um, but yeah, I had at, at that point I'd been married, uh, to a man for about 10 years, um, and had a, had a three-year-old son. Um, and so when I got back from rehab, um, I started counseling um, at a really like open affirming place just to make sure I was like, I'm, you know, before I come out, before I do anything, I'm just going to go do counseling. So, I mean, it was like two months <laughs> and then uh -huh. I'm like, I'm gay. And the counselor's like, how does that feel coming out? And I'm like, it feels good, like really good. So anyway, um, I planned on, you know, I, I told my husband and when I told him I was going to, I mean, the plan was we were going to stay together, right? Yeah, um, that's always the plan. I know. Uh, <laughs> I, I guess you realize sta things in stages, you know. Um, but uh, yeah, I mean, there's I'm missing a lot in between. But um, yeah, that wasn't the case. Um, yeah, I mean, I'd kind of gone back and forth. Um, it wasn't a good marriage, um, and I just, I guess, I didn't know that. <laughs> Yeah, I, I think it was being gay that made me realize, oh my gosh, how how bad it was. Um, and now, like, so I've been separated from him. Um, we're going through divorce right now. We haven't lived together for about eleven months. Mm -hmm. Um, and it's not—I mean, it's not him necessarily. It's just, oh, I just, oh, I'm so glad I don't have to be back in that relationship, and I can just—I mm -hmm. feel so free, even though, I mean, we can talk about it later, but I mean you know, there's so many things from externally, I look kind of untethered, right? Like, um, but I feel so tethered internally. Um, but yeah, so came out to him. He, uh, we initially were going to stay together. Uh, that didn't turn out that way. He's not a nice person. Um, anyway, I just kind of kept going back and forth, back and forth. Like I need to make this work, but I just couldn't. Um, and I ran over a squirrel, which <laughs> sounds Sounds kind of crazy, but I know this so, story. <laughs> yeah, so I was, that was like um a year ago, and that's about um, right. I had kind yeah. of been talking with you a little bit, but I hadn't joined the group. So you you know me from your support group, and um, so I was thinking about joining it, and I'm like, you know, I I I don't really know what the next step is. Well, I'd gone back and forth, and I accidentally ran over this squirrel. I was so sad about it, but it was going, it was like back and forth, back and forth. And I'm like, it, it, it killed itself. It just, you know, and yeah. I'm like, but it's such a great crazy. metaphor, right? For this journey. Yeah. 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 I'm doing that with my life. And so, um, yeah. Um, my life this past year has been a whirlwind. So in July, I did all five things at once that you're supposed to do one at a time. Like I announced my divorce in July, uh, my husband and I, ex-husband, I have to get used to saying that, we decided to move to a new town uh, separately, but together so we could co-parent. Um, we decided that that was the best town uh, to be in because we were close to family, um, which is a whole other story. But it, being close to family is good for um, 
my son, my four year old. So, yeah. Um, so I did a big leap. I mean, this was back in June, July. I started coming out to people. I announced my divorce. I got a brand new job as a counselor. We moved new towns. I did all of that kind of at once. And I was, I was terrified. Um, but looking back, so it's been what, I mean, it's been a while. So looking back, I'm so thankful I did it. Yes. <laughs> uh, yeah. Um, so, I mean, yeah, there's still so many unknowns, but things are, I feel such a sense of like peace, I guess. Mm -hmm. um, and like I say, it looks maybe externally, like there's so many, you know, it looked like well, internally. Yeah, but what's really interesting is I know Hannah's story very well. Um, she disclosed that we worked together in the Lotus Group Coaching. So, and then she was also in, a, in another support group that I had before that. So, mm -hmm. and what I have witnessed is like Hannah I, you you just first of all I love that saying um, what you talk about your coming out you said the slow realization of something I've always known right is yeah, that what you call it I always I I I call it um, when I finally <laughs> acknowledge my sexuality like it like I always like when people ask me I'm always like I knew when I didn't know you know it's like one yeah. of those things and then when I finally acknowledged it I find the universe moves very fast like it, it goes it's like it's like on speed <laughs> it really is, it really is. I'm like and, oh, come on. But what I have noticed about Hannah is that she's very methodical in doing things. And, and I have noticed that, yes, to the culture that she grew up in, and we're going to talk about that now, she does appear to be very untethered. But I have noticed Hannah to have really come into her, her, her own of who she was created to be. Um, and it's been really amazing watching this process with her and how bravely she's engaged it. Like she's one of those people, when I say you need to build community, Hannah goes and builds community. And I really admire her for that because a lot of times people are afraid. And, and the funny thing is H Hannah's a big introvert. So for her to go out and build community is pretty amazing. So Hannah, tell me what it was like when you were growing up in a very conservative southern town oh uh, that's a loaded question too. Um, <laughs> we're gonna get to faith and religion because we had a really great one of the reasons i invited hannah on this show is we had this really like astounding conversation about what she used to believe as a good christian wife and like how much the evolution of her, first of all, getting sober and then realizing she wasn't straight and that she's gay and realizing so many aspects of her life that she used to be really like a firm believer in all of this. And then all of a sudden, everything sort of has fallen away. So you grew up, what faith tradition? Um, so pretty conservative Christian, uh, Assembly of God, Southern Baptist, kind of like that. Um, yeah, so I'd say conservative. I mean, I'm from okay. the South. I live in Texas, small town, Texas. So yeah, pretty so conservative. <laughs> were you, so were you a churchgoer as you grew yeah. up? Yeah. yeah. So was, um, mom and dad took you to church and all that stuff like that. Yeah, my mom, my mom did. Um, and I was really into it. And, um, followed it from a really young age and believed it very heavily the the um the the fundamentalist part of it you know mm -hmm. uh, so which, what is fundamentalist part for people who have no idea what we're talking about like when you I say somebody's a fundamentalist what do you mean by that I don't even know if I could have a good dictionary definition but it's almost like you know it when you see it it's like it's fear-based it's uh it's very fear-based. So they hold hair, hell over your head a lot. It's a lot of legalism, a lot of rules. Um, I didn't even know it uh, when I was in it. It's actually the perpetuators of fundamentalism are the people that are kind of the victims of it. So it's a whole system that holds itself up by its victims perpetuating. And because, you know, I was in that culture. I really believed it. I believed it with my heart. And I had a pure heart in that I, I wanted, I didn't want people to go to hell. Like I really thought, that and so I cried like I would cry for hours over people that I'm like they're not Christian I can't believe this and so it's like it's very steeped in hell it's very much like um 
you're taught to ignore yourself. So the, the verses like, um, oh gosh, I mean, I was quoted them to me all my life. The verses about like the heart being deceitful above things, mm-hmm. above all things, not being able to trust your own self. Those verses are in the Bible, but they really are focused on a fundamentalism. And so what happens is you can't trust yourself, right? You, you believe um, a lot of it's like five point Calvinism where it's like total depravity. And you believe that you're totally depraved, 100% bad. They really lean heavily on um, we're in a fallen world, not in we're creating the image of God. They don't talk about that. They talk about we're in a fallen world. You know, they really like to lean on Eve being part of that anyway. Um, <laughs> okay. Yeah. So it's kind of like, you know, it when you see it, um, but very fear based, very much like just. Well, but yeah. also thinking about leaning on Eve, that's that's the beginning. It's it's very cultish, you know, if you really. Yeah, because what you just described right now, when you said um, something about it's perpetuated by its own members, you know, yeah. that's 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 very cult like that's how cults yeah. work and 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 i i'm sure that people who belong to these faith traditions might be a little, would be horrified that i would say that but mm-hmm. in a way that is how cults work is by getting the the victims of the system to perpetuate the system yeah. Hey, Anne-Marie, you have been working with the Later in Life community for about five years now. Is that right? Yeah, Barb, that's right. You know, it has been such an amazing five years of helping women, trans and non-binary people through their process of coming out, going from their straight lives to the LGBTQIA plus community. Anytime I read through your testimonials page, I get a little choked up. I'm going to be honest, because I see what the Lotus Group Coaching Program has done for people and how it has literally changed lives for the better. And this year, the coaching program has undergone some changes to make it even better. Yes, Barb, and thank you so much. We've worked really hard on this Lotus Group Coaching Program, haven't we? (laughs) Yeah, we sure have. So we're trying to make it even more accessible to more people because as you know, there are thousands of us out there who are just starting on their coming out journey. Okay, let's explain to the people, what does new and improved Lotus Group Coaching Program look like? So I'm excited to tell you, Lotus Group Coaching is a four month holistic program that includes a mixture of individual and group coaching an online learning platform with tons of resources, worksheets, articles, and videos, and new coaches, including you, my friend. Yay! <laughs> That's right. Hey, uh, I'm so excited. And, you know, I'm new to the coaching team and working with later in lifers who have had a catalyst experience. And I'm your coach if you're stepping out into the world of dating in the queer community. We've got another amazing team member, too. Yeah, actually, we do. And her name is Linda Moore, our resident Reiki master and energy healer and she works with our coaching clients remotely to help group members feel more aligned and grounded and at the heart of this program the thing that provides what i think is the most value is the group coaching sessions you know i don't think people understand how group coaching is really transformative our group members will tell you this part of the program has such a huge impact It's where you can be in a community of people who are on this journey that you are. You see yourself reflected in the stories of others, gain clarity and so much wisdom from other people who are on this coming out journey with you. Okay, so in addition to having access to three great individual coaches, group coaching, an online learning platform, there's also a secret Facebook group that's just for group members only. Yes. And really, as a member, you have an access to the secret Facebook group forever, but also to the online course forever as well. And you'll also be first in line for any special promotions or events or workshops, which you'll learn about through the Lotus Group Coaching Newsletter. And there's an enormous value to this program. So if you're feeling ready to tackle the big life transition of coming out, join us. We're a lot of fun. Absolutely. Yes. Please don't go through this very challenging process alone. 
learn and be supported by others who have come before you. You know, Emery and Linda and I, we're all later in life too. Yeah, and you know what else I want to say is that sometimes when we are overwhelmed with all the feelings of coming out, we also tend to isolate ourselves. We begin to withdraw from our communities and the people that love us because they don't understand this process. And so you don't have to do this alone. Let us stand with you. We will walk beside you shoulder to shoulder as we guide you towards a life where you can be open, out, secure, and proud in your queer identity. Just look in the show notes below and you'll find links to book discovery calls with Anne-Marie and Linda and I. And call us. Tell us your story. Let us show you how to come out later in life successfully. We really look forward to hearing from you. Sort of like, yeah. sort of yeah, like yeah, the exactly. patriarchy. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah. yeah so, it's weird, it's like these people I've grown to love and know. I mean, I love them. They love me, but we're we're they're perpetuating the system. You know, it's it's not these mostly. They're not evil people. Like no, absolutely it, not. And like yeah. you, like like you said about yourself, is that you were really sincere about mm-hmm. being a good. Christian wife. So tell me what that meant. What was that like for when you were married to your husband? What was it like? How did you define being a good wife or a good Christian wife? Well, oh gosh. And you I worked in like, the church too for a while as well, right? Yeah, I was like a secretary in the Southern Baptist right around the time Trump was elected. So I was becoming disillusioned very quickly. Like so, uh, yeah, um, and my husband, our ex-husband, gosh, it's weird. I, he's he's even more on the less control end of it. But, yeah, and I don't want to, like, go into well, detail. I think, I think, I think but, well, because I think, um, and I know you don't want to go, but we can just say, you know, in, in the, you know, in the conservative faiths, there's like complement, complementarianism, oh yeah, complementarianism and egalitarianism. egalitarianism. And your, I know that your husband believed he was an egalitarian. He thought he was. Yeah. Yeah. Um, and, and so, I mean, he does, he, in his mind, he was, um, but he doesn't really believe, like, he doesn't understand the process. You can't just believe something in your mind and just get it right so it's like for me you know I know being being a gay there's nothing wrong with it now I've come to know that but I still got to work through that internalized homophobia right I mean being I was told gay people go to hell so it's like I recognize that right and that it's it's psychological too but he's just like oh I believe that it's men and women are equal therefore I'm egalitarianism and I'm like he believed it in theory and he did his best he could but he just didn't get it's psychological. I mean, there's a right. lot of deconstruction that you got to do to be able to get there. And and Joe, for those who don't know, complementarianism is that men is God is the head is the head. Man, man men are right underneath God, and women are made to complement the, mm-hmm. the 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 man, the man. And so, yeah. um, in complementarianism, women are asked to submit to the authority of God who get and and their husband so it's like a linear process god husband wife and Mm -hmm. that's how it goes which as any i think person who has who can extrapolate endings with that that's right there can be a lot of abuse there it's a system you set the system up for abusers to abuse Abuse. it is it is set up that way even as a counselor you know you recognize Count the professional counseling setup, you recognize the power dynamic. And so they have all these rules, you know, that, that, you know, you try to keep the client as safe as possible, you know, because of that power dynamic, but they don't seem to recognize that in the church. And so it's like, gosh, it's just ripe for abuse. It, mm-hmm. it and, and it's ripe for gaslighting and going. And I've even, I've even worked with people before that's been told, oh, you need to glorify God. And he might've done this to you, but if you speak of it, then you are not unifying the church. You're going to be in charge of putting a sword in the church and uh, you're making him look bad and he is glorifying God. And if you tell people what he did to you, then you're in charge of um, 
like not glorifying God and making his ministry go downhill and and, and people are going to go to hell because of you. It's been, it's that bad. It can go that, that bad. And it makes me so angry. <laughs> well, yeah. and that's like, so Hannah and I had a conversation about this and that's why I think that sometimes people don't understand and because Hannah, like, I don't even think I understood until, because I come from progressive Christianity and we came from Catholicism, but that's a whole different ball of wax than Southern Baptist and Pentecostal. Like I was, you know, as a, as a Catholic woman, I was never said that if I, you know, um, reported abuse with my um, spouse or something like that, that I would be putting a knife into the church. I like that was never, ever on my okay. radar. So. As you were working in the church, um, first of all, I would love to hear about your before. Like, what did you believe and wholeheartedly believed? Um, and it's like a slow unfolding for me. So I'm still kind of deconstructing. Yeah, you're deconstructing still. I mean, you know, I, I believed that, um, Gosh, I mean, I guess I believe that there was very, very narrow way to believe and that people would go to hell and that it never made sense to me why loving God would send people to hell. But I'm like, I, and they, they would always quote these verses to you, lean not on your own understanding. You know, God's ways are higher than your ways. Um, the heart is deceitful above all things. So you, you're taught to, to second guess your own uh, compassion and go God's compassion is higher than your compassion there for him sending people to hell does it look it might it might go against you but his ways are higher that's actually loving it's it and you have to do all these mental gymnastics so I believe that even though I wrestled that with that my whole life I was just like that doesn't make sense um I don't believe that anymore um yeah well, I yeah I wrestled with the with like like um the loving God. And like, for me, mine came really young when I was like 14. And it was when, you know, I started to learn about the Holocaust and realized all the things that um, happened to humans. And, and I couldn't reconcile why a God that was all powerful yeah. would let that happen. Like, I wrestled with, I mean, you know, 14 is really young to start wrestling with those things, but I was, but I had been, I was really like you. I was like a, a, somebody who liked, like church for me. I wrote about it in my book. Is it like church provided stability for me because I always knew what was going to happen Well, my home life wasn't so much. And I went to Catholic school too. So yeah. I mean, school and church was where there was order and I knew what was going to happen. Yeah. Uh, every time I went to mass like and while home was rules and lived your life this way your life's gonna be good <laughs> right and and yeah. so that's I believe that and the, but then I realized and then I'm like well how could it, if a loving all-powerful God how could he let millions and and it was he then God is not he for me anymore yeah. but he like how could, that he's feminine. yeah like how could that all happen like how could that happen so it sounds like from the beginning, you were also like, wait a minute, <laughs> this doesn't make too much sense. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And it always really bothered me. Yeah. But mm -hmm. things have helped. Like, I, I mean, I've read a lot of books. Like I kind of was methodical about this whole thing. Cause I realized that when I come, come out, you know, I, I knew I wasn't going to have a lot of support in my world. So I was like, I need to double down on my education, on my books, on developing good community. And uh, podcast. And so I've read a lot of books that have kind of helped me see it differently. I mean, it's a whole process, but I think for me, the big difference is before I was filled with just so much shame, second guessing myself, doubting myself. I think I was full of shame and I was in chains without knowing it. And now I feel free. Um, I love others a lot more. Like I'm a lot grace, more graceful with other people and with, with myself. And I'm just, I guess I appreciate people more like I don't know like there was this weird person wearing a sword methodical costume in the mall the other day and some kind of and before I'd be like who's that dude why is he wearing? but I'm just like you do you brother I don't care like, yeah. and that's not hurting anyone they think great like I celebrate diversity now and yeah I don't know I guess I just um 
last year was the hardest year of my life, but it was also the best year of my life because I've just I've come to see myself differently with a lot more grace and less pressure. And I just um I guess I'm just tired of feeling bad about myself all the time. That's what religion does. Like, and I'm not knocking all like Christianity, all religion, just the 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 fundamentalist yeah. sect that I grew up in. Um, it just mm -hmm. makes you feel bad about yourself. You're always repenting. You you never trust yourself, except authority. Um, you're told like scripture is is the ultimate source of authority, which you know maybe, but it's how like we're not told well it's interpreted by men and you're just trusting that interpretation right so right. It's, it's just it's i guess the the wizard of oz the veil came off and i was just like oh my gosh i feel jaded like i'm very disillusioned but i don't want to to the point where i want to just throw it all out i mean mm -hmm. I, you know mm -hmm. um but i'm just past the point of fundamentalism i just i would like to throw that out <laughs> So what was expected of you as a young woman in fundamentalist Christianity? Oh my gosh, to dress modestly, which was not hard for me because I did not like the male gaze. I did not like the male gaze at all. So, so, <laughs> um, so I actually, um, so say I, more about a, a why did you, so woman. for what? people who don't understand, I understand, but some people don't. So you have to dress modestly why um so it depends on what level but basically you don't want to be a stumbling stumbling block to your brother in christ and they'll be like no we're not blaming you for for, for making him fall in sin but we kind of are so yeah you're basically women are given all the responsibility for managing their man and the household and everything, but none of the power. So basically it's just, it's a system designed to make people feel like shit, like, you mm -hmm. know, mm -hmm. um, and it's not good for the men either. Um, so like, I just, why, I do, know, you, I just, why do you say that? Well, it's like that toxic masculinity. I mean, you know, um, okay. So I worked with, I worked at a domestic abuse shelter in that hole when they're sad they can't cry, they're gonna get angry. When they feel hurt, they can't express they feel hurt, they're gonna get angry and hurt and tear up shit when they're, um, you know, they can't, uh, it's all about being stoic and tough and, and uh, well, being, yeah. Have you ever listened to Brene Brown and she talks about women's, women's vulnerability is around shame while men's vulnerability is around appearing weak men never like they get shamed for appearing weak well women get shamed for about about 50 different things <laughs> you know about their appearance about you well, know your color your ears are too big your tooth is weird looking you have a you know yeah so the so so the expectations were the for the women were that they had to take care of everything yeah you had to that, manage his emotions as well mm-hmm Mm -hmm. yeah. So you're responsible for your husband's emotions. You are. And like, how about your children's? Um, in some sets. Yeah. But he, he did a, you know, in mine, he did a, he did a pretty good job with that, but yeah. Um, he didn't know it, you know, I don't want to get, he, he didn't know his emotions. That was a mm -hmm. huge issue. Um, I would constantly be like, are you upset? Are you sad to be like, no. And you know, you're not supposed to tell other people how they feel, but I'm going, okay. <laughs> you know, um, oh, you're supposed to be a virgin when you get married. Like that's, mm -hmm. so I basically was every Christian man's mother's desire for his little, their little boy to marry. Like, cause I did. I, so I've only dated one guy who was my husband. <laughs> But there's a reason. <laughs> yeah. No, this was back in the AOL dial up days. And so like in high school, if a guy was like, I'm going to call you because I like you or something, instead of being like, no, no, thank you or something, you know, I'd be like, OK, and then just get on the dial up Internet. And so I'd uh, plug up the hold up the phone line so he could he couldn't call me anyway. <laughs> um, yeah. So I so, yeah, I'm basically every young men's mothers they they because I dress modestly I haven't dated many men I don't I didn't sleep around with guys but that was just because I was gay so um, <laughs> yeah. 
Anne-Marie, I hear you have a new project in the works. Yes, ma'am, I sure do. And I am so beyond excited to talk about it. It is time for me to spill the beans. Okay, okay, girl, spill the tea. What are you up to? Okay, so I am starting a brand new podcast called Queer Business Success. This is a show devoted to queer coaches, therapists, and entrepreneurs showcasing to the world unique businesses led by people within our LGBTQ plus community. In doing this podcast, I want to uplift those amazing queer entrepreneurs, highlighting the important work they do and demonstrating how queer business owners add tangible value to our communities. I want this podcast to be an inspiration to any person in the LGBTQIA plus community and show you that if the queer business owners on the podcast can be a success, so can you. Oh gosh. Okay. I love this. I love this. And we both know how important representation is for our community. It is so important for visibility and for acceptance, for tolerance, and really for the good of everyone to see examples of queer people lead and succeed in business. And in today's social and political climate, this is more important than ever. Visibility matters, right? That's a key motivator for me in starting the Queer Business Success Podcast because I want you, the queer listener, to hear examples of success stories from other queer entrepreneurs and for those stories to give you inspiration and confidence to step up, step out, and build your own queer business success story. Learning from the successes and the lessons of others who have come before you I love this. Me too. And we'll be talking about all kinds of things related to business success, but we also want to hear about challenges too. We are promoting you, your product, and your service for visibility to our LGBTQIA community, but also to the whole world as well. All right. Well, I'm here for it. Where and when can I tune in? The Queer Business Success Podcast drops soon on Spotify, YouTube, Google Podcasts, Apple Podcasts, and wherever you normally tune in. Just search for it on your favorite platform. That's Queer Business Success with me, your host, Amory Zanzel. And fill out the form in the show notes to be alerted when the first show drops. And if you have a business that you would like us to highlight, shoot us a quick email at support at amoryzanzel.com. That will be in the show notes as well. I remember, remember True Love Weights? I, I had the little yeah. ring. I wore, I wore the True Love Weights ring. Yeah, I've heard about that. Has, I can, I, can I ask you, a lot of the people that have been a part of like purity culture and when True Love Weights and stuff like that, did it mess up your sexuality? Not well, just, not just, I'm talk, not talking about um, uh, being gay, but just like owning like sexual, sexuality yeah. and stuff like yeah, that. Maybe- weird about about it and I think I just well for one I I think I didn't realize I was gay because mm-hmm. of that um big mm-hmm. time I mean big time uh, mm-hmm. we did we did wait until marriage and I, I was like well something's up like I mean this is not what I expected yeah like is there something else fireworks are supposed to come out like I mean is that it like anyway so yeah none of that happened no no and you know if I was not gay I'm sure yeah. Well, that's like me. I mean, like I was when I was with with men when I was younger, I had such. So I was taught that, um, you know, you wait till you get married, which I didn't. So then I felt shame that I didn't. Uh, yeah. And, and and so but but I was like, but it wasn't very good. But I was also like, well, you're just you feel shame, you feel guilt. That's why it doesn't feel really good or anything like that. I I, like it took me the longest time to make the connection that it was, you know, you know, sexuality in when it from when I grew up, sexuality was just bad. Like, you know, you didn't talk about it. It was all very swept under the rug. You know, it was like, you just didn't talk. My mother never talked to me about it, you know, beyond like, yeah, it was just, I knew how to make babies, but that was about, you know, Um, so how has your family been with all of this? (laughs) Well, um, 
And that's, what that's advice cool. do you, what would advice would you give? Like if you had a client, I know your family's been tough and you can talk a little bit about that, but what would your advice be for a client if, if, you know, they're dealing with a, a family when they're coming out? Manage your expectations. Uh, I would <laughs> say be optimistically pessimistic. So um, I kind of knew I was like, my family, they're not going to be like, woo, let's make a party, you know, cake. Um, so I, from my experience, so it wasn't as bad as I feared. They didn't kick me out, cuss me out, but it definitely wasn't as good as I hoped. Um, there was a mm-hmm. lot of minimizing and, you know, just it was not great. Um, but I prepared. So once I realized I was gay and I wasn't going to stay in my marriage, I kind of panicked at first. And then I was like, get a list and just write down how you're going to survive. And I was like, well, what would I tell my clients? And so I prepared. um, You know, I came out the same time I told everybody I was getting a divorce. I would not. Everyone's different. I I would advise that because everybody, you know, he's running around now telling everybody we're divorcing because I'm gay. And that was, a, a, I'm sure, a factor. But Anyway, it, it takes, it, it, well, I, it and honest, so yeah. yeah. And to be really <laughs> honest with you, I, I did the same thing. If I had to do it all over again, I would not have, um, yeah. I would not because what ends up happening is that a lot of the guys want to be seen as good guys and they want to yeah. make sure that everybody knows it's not their yeah. fault Absolutely. that they're getting divorced. And so what happens when you tie your coming out to your divorce, it it makes you quote unquote responsible. Mm-hmm. And a lot of times people aren't responsible. Their marriages have a lot of problems that have nothing to do with them being gay. And, held accountable. and so, I mean, that is what it is. And another piece of advice, don't put your energy into the, to the haters. Um, I'm putting a lot of boundaries in place right now. Like I know my family loves me. And I have hope that, you know, we're going to get to work through it. Yeah. Right now, we're just not there. Last time I saw him, I left crying. Um, And so we're just, we need to put some boundaries in place. Like, it's almost like banging my head against the wall, trying to get them to understand. And they're not because they don't want to. Um, But also they can't because they're not gay. Yeah. And I think. So I have people that have come out to that they don't understand, but they ask questions from a curiosity mm-hmm. t- type of way. And I love that. But then there's people that don't understand. And they act, they're questioning you in a, in a different, it's not from I a curiosity that. way. It's like, hmm, hmm. that's mm-hmm. the way, I, anyway, that's how my family does. Um, I'm totally fine with questions and all that, but um, not in that way. Like mm-hmm. it's just mm-hmm. it's doubting, it's minimizing, it's, they think I've lost my mind, <laughs> but I'm like, no, I totally found it. I have a sticker <laughs> on my microwave of all places that says being, being straight was my phase. <laughs> yes. <laughs> like, I feel that. Feel it. <laughs> um, what kind of advice would you give to somebody that, you know, we talked a little bit about religion tonight. What would advice would you give to somebody that is beginning to deconstruct their religion? Um, and if you can remember, if you can, rem- sometimes it's really hard to remember names of books when you're put on the spot, yeah. but if you can remember, name some books that were helpful for you. Yeah, well, so um, a, a book, yeah, so uh, I really liked Kendall Ray Rothis's book, um, Thy Kingdom, Thy Kingdom Come. Mm-hmm. Uh, it's, it's great because uh, a lot of these evangelical books I've read before, they're very prescriptive. Well, she's not prescriptive. She's very much like she invites you on a journey and she invites you to imagine. And she really shows you just how it could be. Um, so if you're looking to not totally just let leave, you know, Christianity and you you want a new way of seeing it, that book's great. It was hopeful. And I also... Um, Kendall Ray Roth, this is the one who wrote it. And I also do a spiritual um, direct, like she's my spiritual director person. She just like to call herself that. It's more of a spiritual guidance person. So just somebody that I, a sounding board, uh, someone that can listen. Uh, she listens really well. Um, I mean, I'm sure she's open to accepting clients. That's been a lifesaver for me. Uh, your group's been great in that deconstruction. Uh, 
and your podcast. I, for me, memoirs are great. Uh, and if you're looking to deconstruct uh, from the gay thing, uh, I don't know if you're familiar with Julie Rogers' um, Out Love, her book. Or, mm-hmm. No, I'm not. No. So she comes from a very fundamentalist uh, focus in the family kind of tradition. And I think she stayed with her faith, maybe, but not that fundamentalist part. Um, and she kind of goes, it, it's more of a memoir. And she really kind of shares her heart. Um Affirming is another good one. Uh, that, that's a good uh, just kind of memoir as well. I think that one's by, I wrote it down. Hold on. Um, well, I don't, I don't know where I had it. But um, anyway, look up the book Affirming. So it's somewhere well, else. We'll have all the links to all these books in the show notes of the, of the podcast. Oh, uh, God is Gray. That's a podcast I listen to. Gray, J- G-R-E-Y. Um, mm-hmm. That's a really good, it mixes humor with good, just good information to educate yourself. Because mm-hmm. that, That's good advice, educate yourself. <laughs> well, and I also really <laughs> like the, it's what you've said about it before. And it's funny because when I started the show and, and saying, you know, watching you go through this process, the word that was coming to mind that I didn't say, but you said is that you were methodical. <laughs> and that's what you were, is that you were pretty, I mean, after the initial, you know, like that the month of July where everything was going crazy, you actually got pretty methodical about everything. and yeah. and. And also like, and and this is the hard part is, especially when we're really, we really love our families and care about them when they're not accepting or they're, they're just dismissive. It can be really, really painful, but I do believe what Hannah says is true is that we really have to learn to set good boundaries with our family when they're causing us a lot of pain and also not to continually put ourselves in a, in a vulnerable place when our families are being really tough on us, especially when you're coming out um, conservatively religious as well. Like being very aware of the clobber passages and stuff like that. So you know how to not have those conversations because you're never going to win. And so don't try. (laughs) Yeah, my family's like, can you just sit down with us and go through it? And then then the next breath they go, but we're not going to ever change our minds. So I'm like, to me, I'm like, that's set up for failure. Like, I don't, if you're going to approach it that way, then no. Yeah. So Hannah, do you have a coming out song? Um, I do. Where did I write that? Did I not write my song down? Well, I can look it up. You said your coming out song is I Am. Okay, that's a good one. By Sad Sang. That's a, I look to that one every day. Mm -hmm. And then you said Waking Up. Yeah, that just describes my journey. (laughs) And then you said Fidelity by Regina Spector. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And so did you ever read, uh, of course you have, but do you have a book or a movie that really changed your perspective on life? Oh, Elena Undone. Have you read, have you seen that movie? Yeah, a long time ago. That movie was when I was like, I might not be straight. I might not be straight. <laughs> and then I think I've watched it 30 times. 30 times. <laughs> While well, I'm in that kissing scene, it was like a two minute, three minute long kissing scene. I kept rewinding it, just telling myself, I just <laughs> happened to like all the mental gymnastics I did. So what were your mental gym? What were your mental gymnastics? What did I, I think I was just telling myself I just appreciate uh when when uh, two women kiss, because you can see both of their emotions really well, and it's more emotive, and women are, I, like, I don't know what I did. <laughs> <laughs> and you're a Brene Brown fan, so yeah, Braving, Braving the Wilderness. The wilderness has been good uh, for me now, because I've been by my, you know, kind of, sort of by myself, but I've, uh, it's since kind of done the rainbow, tra- um, I've joined something called the Rainbow Traveling uh, Tribe. Mm-hmm. Um, and I actually just accepted a leadership position on that committee. Uh, and like once a week we go camping out in nature and it's just a bunch of gay women with big dogs and tents. 
And so <laughs> I fit in fine. Hiking boots, <laughs> big dogs, tents. We're good, you know, like beer. <laughs> I don't drink it, but you know, so. So yeah. how would you, so you also mentioned a couple of the books that you mentioned in this in in our conversation, but how would you describe your life today? Um, so I wrote it down. Um, so yeah, I think it, um, I think I'd kind of written that. Um, I've n- I've never been so content in like body, mind, and soul. Um. I feel kind of an inner sense of security, actually, although mm-hmm. there's a lot of more unknowns, which is mm-hmm. ironic. Mm-hmm. Um, yeah, um, I kind of live my day by day now, and I just I, I appreciate things. Um, I don't consume as much as I, I'm just I try to be grateful and it's a whole different way of living. I don't know it. Um, and I just I'm not full of so much shame anymore. Um, and I it's actually, I show up very differently in relationships. Like I really, once I came out, I just started to be about the gay thing, but I, everything's changed. Uh, I'm, I would never have been on the show in a million years. Mm-hmm. <laughs> yeah, so, absolutely. Would you have, so Hannah does roller derby. Would you have done ro- roller derby? No, no. <laughs> I'm showing up to a gay camp out by myself. <laughs> <laughs> like, and it's really helpful my internalized homophobia because when I first showed up, I mean, by myself, like, I didn't know, I, I had not been around a lot of gay people. Um, and so when they were, they would kiss, I'd be like, where do I look? Where do I look? What do I, what do, I do? What do I look? And like, now I'm just like, you know, when yeah. <laughs> helped. that's helped. Well, oh, listen, yeah. Hannah, I want to thank you so much for sharing your story today mm-hmm. and sharing such good advice for people. I really appreciate your advice. And I also really appreciate you. So thank you so much for giving me your time tonight and appearing on the show. All right. Well, thanks. It's good to be on the show. (laughs) You've been listening to Coming Out and Beyond LGBTQIA plus stories with Anne-Marie Zanzel. New episodes of the Coming Out and Beyond podcast drop every other Friday. You can tune in at Apple Podcasts, Spotify, Google Podcasts, and at annemariezanzel.com. Be sure to hit subscribe when tuning in so you never miss an episode. And for more resources, articles, videos, and a free downloadable guide for coming out later in life, visit annemariezanzel.com.